It is unfortunate that one of my favorite attractions, Poseidon's Fury, is closing at Islands of Adventure. And no, before you ask, my channel name has nothing to do with the attraction. Poseidon's Fury is one of those unique experiences that would never be conceived in today's entertainment landscape, existing almost as a time capsule of camp from around the turn of the century. It is Universal Orlando's water world in a sense, with its ridiculous, exaggerated campy flair, and for those who have appreciated it for what it was trying to do, it's a sad loss. For those unfamiliar, Poseidon's Fury is an ambitious walkthrough show, centered around the novelty of its 40 foot long spinning water tunnel, using 40 water nozzles to blast water at a speed of up to 100 miles per hour to create the effect. It's a strange and quirky attraction that doesn't play well to the public, but is definitely a favorite among many theme park fans. That's why its closure isn't particularly surprising, and while I'm disappointed to see it leave, I do understand that it's necessary. I suspect that over the next few years, the remainder of the land it resides in, the Lost Continent, will be demolished and eventually replaced with something much more exciting. That's why I decided to produce this video, because as the Lost Continent has miraculously managed to survive, even after a large part of it was taken and rethemed for the Wizarding World of Harry Potter in 2010, I've continued to be surprised by how long it has stuck around. I think now that Poseidon's Fury is closing as its last remaining attraction, it's time to produce a retrospective on one of the most unique and original theme park lands to ever exist, covering its theming, rides, and shows. While I'm excited to see what comes next, the Lost Continent has existed as an important part of themed attraction history, and so let's now travel back to 1999 and explore the Lost Continent that defined those early years of Islands of Adventure. With the success of Universal Studios Florida in 1990, Universal quickly aimed to expand their Florida property into a complete resort experience. As part of this, a second park was conceptualized as Cartoon World, which was intended to bring together a number of IPs to appeal to younger children. However, as the idea continued to evolve, the theme became focused around literature as a contrast to the studio and movie-focused theming of Universal Studios Florida. Islands of Adventure opened in 1999, featuring an incredibly themed land known as the Port of Entry to immediately evoke that sense of adventure. In terms of literary theme, Marvel Superhero Island and Toon Lagoon represented literature in the form of comics. Seuss Landing was obviously based around the books of Dr. Seuss, and the anchor land, Jurassic Park, is loosely based on both Michael Crichton's novel and Steven Spielberg's film adaptation. However, one land stood out among the others, based not on established contemporary IP, but rather ancient and medieval myths and legends. Just over the bridge from Seuss Landing, we are swept into a mysterious world. A mythical land long buried beneath the sea in the ruins of ancient history. A realm of power pageantry, and glory. In the promotion for the park, an interpretation of Merlin introduces viewers to the Lost Continent, divided into three distinct sections with their own respective attractions. If you take the bridge from Seuss Landing, the first section of this land is the Lost City, clearly themed around Greek mythology and the myth of Atlantis. Continuing further, you'll walk into Sinbad's Bazaar, based off of the Sinbad stories often lumped in with a thousand and one Arabian Nights. Finally, the portion of the land that eventually became the Wizarding World was known as Merlinwood, themed to Arthurian myths and legends. What made this area of the park so interesting was that while it was based on well-established stories, a lot of creative liberty was taken with these interpretations in creating some of the most unique attractions to exist in a theme park. 
As you enter the Lost Continent, the first element you are likely to notice is the Griffin, and from there, as you round the corner, the Greek mythology-themed restaurant known as Mythos. The rock work with waterfalls is incredibly well realized, depicting a mythical city emerging, and if you pay attention, you'll see the faces of the gods carved into it. For example, near the entrance, you can view Narcissus staring at his reflection down at the pool below, and nearby, the face of Zeus emerges from the rocks, with a waterfall spouting from his mouth. A lot of people don't know this, but if you take a small pathway down to the lagoon, you'll cross a bridge where you can hear a groaning troll underneath. On the lagoon-facing side of the restaurant, you'll also manage to see an epic statue of what I believe is Atlas, holding up the rock facade. Approaching from the front, you'll notice a banner that proudly declares that it has been rated as the world's best theme park restaurant by Theme Park Insider, which I might actually consider to be... Mm, misleading advertising. I've eaten at Mythos many times, and while its dishes can potentially be quite good, it's often hit or miss depending on the dish. I do find it laughable that Theme Park Insider somehow rated the slew of average dishes on the menu as better than Carthay Circle, the high-end restaurant at Disney's California Adventure. But, at the very least, I do like the theming and atmosphere. It's also worth mentioning that the interior was designed by Jordan Moser, who is best known for the interiors of the Cheesecake Factory. On learning this information, I did begin to see how his distinct style came to shape this space, and now it's difficult for me to not perceive it as an in-part version of... well, the Cheesecake Factory. Overall, I like Mythos as a restaurant with interesting theming and good food if you know how to navigate the menu, but it's certainly not a contender for best theme park restaurant. A quick favor, but if you're enjoying this look back into the history of the Lost Continent, you can help this video out by simply leaving a like. It's a very easy thing to do that helps the video reach a wider audience, and if you've done so, I appreciate it. Across the pathway from Mythos is the last remaining attraction from the land, Poseidon's Fury. When you first encounter the trident and the remains of what must have been a massive statue of Poseidon, this incredibly impressive and unique facade creates an immense sense of intrigue. The flowing water and mist effect throughout the outdoor portion of the queue works really well in conjunction with the ruined Atlantean theme. The scale of the building in the background feels massive, even as you begin to approach it, and once you enter the temple of Poseidon himself, the dark and eerie corridors really set a mood of frightful anticipation. When the attraction first opened with the park, the story was completely different from how it exists today. Once this walkthrough attraction began, the first scene put guests into a room where they met a bearded and bizarre old man, known as the Keeper. He would tell the story of a battle between Zeus and his jealous brother Poseidon, who had threatened to flood the world. As the story was told, murals would light up around the room to visually represent the story as its narrative progressed. Eventually, the Keeper is interrupted by the voice of a woman known as the Oracle, who then opens the way into a second chamber that everyone proceeds to move into. Once the crowd settles, the Oracle begins to recite a spell that will unlock a passageway to Poseidon, and the different portions of the doorway ahead twist into place, revealing the face of Poseidon himself. As the door rolls away, visitors were often stunned to see the magnificent water tunnel vortex, which would act as the portal to bring everyone directly into Atlantis. Once visitors settle into the stands in this new location, the Temple of Poseidon, the Keeper bemoans that they're now stuck in this chamber, and the promises of Poseidon were nothing but a trick. An extremely poor CGI rendition of Poseidon appears, and welcomes guests to their new permanent home. Angrily, the Keeper mentions that these are the patrons of Zeus, and on hearing his name, Poseidon's demeanor instantly changes. In his rage, he attacks the Keeper, which manifests physically as water effects on the stage. Poseidon then announces his plan to fold everyone into his army to wage war with Zeus, and as he does so, the Keeper reveals that he himself is actually Zeus in human form. He abandons his body and appears as CGI on the water screens, 
using fire as his weapon, manifesting as pyro and water effects that ignite on stage to portray the ensuing battle. After this special effects spectacular, Zeus defeats Poseidon and the temple begins to crumble around the guests. Quickly working to save them, Zeus chants a spell that results in a blinding flash of light, as visitors suddenly find themselves back in the original chambers of the Oracle. This effect is achieved through drop-down walls, which is similar to the teleportation effect in Guardians of the Galaxy Cosmic Rewind in Epcot, but on a much larger scale. The Keeper then reappears, pretending to be oblivious to the events that have just transpired, and leads everyone out of the ruins back into the park. This first version of the attraction did not last very long, and its story, world-building, and poorly realized CGI finale did not resonate well with park guests. Poseidon's Fury then closed in April 2001 for an extensive reworking of the story that also added new and different elements to the interior theming. After a turnaround of only three months, Poseidon's Fury reopened with a new story, introducing guests to a character known as Taylor, a member of the Global Discovery Group, which is hosting a tour of Poseidon's Temple. Instead of being passive observers like in the first version, Taylor first confronts the visitors by insisting that the tour cannot begin without Professor Baxter, who was last known to be exploring the temple but has not been seen for some time. Taylor then launches into the story of how one of Poseidon's high priests, Lord Darkanon, became jealous of Poseidon. Taylor then relates how, long ago, Darkanon sealed the very chamber that everyone is currently standing in, and sacrificed the worshippers of Poseidon to an unknown dark entity which granted Darkanon divine powers capable of challenging Poseidon himself. As Taylor jokes that the souls of the dead still haunt the temple, a ghostly wailing is heard throughout the room. Suddenly, the lights flicker out and Taylor picks up the professor's UV flashlight, accidentally illuminating a hidden message. Taylor shines the light around the room and reads the spell, and at its conclusion, Professor Baxter appears over the radio, frantically instructing everyone to quickly get out. Before Taylor can respond, an evil laugh permeates the chamber, revealing himself to be Lord Darkanon, and invites guests further into the temple. From behind the crowd, a hidden doorway reveals what is known as the Chamber of Death, as everyone is then herded into this new location. I have always enjoyed the decrepit theming of ancient treasures in this room, and once the doors are sealed, Taylor reappears again to nervously talk about how Professor Baxter will be glad that they've discovered all of this historic treasure. Suddenly, Darkanon's voice booms over the audience, declaring that if they don't bring him the trident of Poseidon, they will die in this very chamber. As the room begins to fill with poisonous gas, which is achieved with a mist effect, Taylor runs around frantically, looking for something to pry open a door with. He grabs an unsuspecting handle, which is revealed to be Poseidon's trident, and as he does so, Darkanon's power is broken. A goddess, the guardian of the temple, then appears, instructing Taylor to provide her with one single wish that she will grant. Taylor asks to leave the temple, but the goddess reveals that she is incapable of overriding Lord Darkanon's lock. Instead, she insists that she can lead everyone further into the heart of the temple and begins to recite a spell. At its conclusion, the door opens, revealing the impressive water portal that everyone will travel through in order to reach Poseidon's chamber. As you enter the vortex, it is itself a bit of a sensory experience, as you move through the warm, incredibly humid air, and are occasionally sprinkled by droplets of water as it excitingly rushes all around you. Stepping into the final chamber, the disembodied voice of Poseidon expresses his appreciation to Taylor for bringing back his prized trident. He instructs Taylor to follow his voice and return the trident to him, but Lord Darkanon interrupts, declaring that the trident is his. The room darkens and a bright flash blinds the audience. The drop-down walls retract during this brief moment, and it is quickly revealed that everyone has been teleported underwater, illuminating what I presume is Atlantis and Poseidon, frozen in stone as a statue. Suddenly, Darkanon appears on the water screen and uses his powers of fire to attempt to steal the trident from Taylor. Avoiding his attacks, Taylor returns the trident to the hands of the statue, and Poseidon appears fully restored declaring that he will triumph over Darkanon. The ensuing battle is much like the first version of the attraction, 
using pyro and water effects to make it seem as if the audience is witnessing an epic battle. At its conclusion, Darkanon appears to explode, and Poseidon reappears, declaring his victory. As the city begins to crumble behind him, he declares that he will grant everyone safe passage back to their world. With a final fireball to blind the audience, the room briefly goes dark and suddenly reveals that everyone has been transported back into the last chamber. From here, everyone is herded out of the room and back outside to the park. This version of the attraction has been very polarizing, and while it has certainly fared better than the original, it's one of those things that you either love or hate. Walking up to the impressive facade and entering the dark tunnels of the queue, many people don't know what to really expect. Throughout the first and second chambers, the attraction maintains a mysterious, foreboding tone that was alleviated with the comedic performance of Taylor and their quips as they bumble around throughout the experience. The water tunnel itself is an impressive technical effect, and does seem to promise something even more epic beyond. However, after the initial surprise of the retracting walls in the final room, Lord Darkanon and Poseidon can be just too much camp for some people, and the tone can drastically change to comedy. While the pyro and water effects are good theoretically, the battle often looks less like a battle, and more just like a mess where two men dressed up on the budget of a Power Rangers episode just yell at each other as they teleport around the room. Personally, I have always enjoyed this attraction for the atmosphere and mystery up until the finale, but I do also think that this portion is part of its charm. I always enjoy attractions that have odd or strange elements that make you wonder what happens in the creative process. That's part of what makes an attraction memorable to me, and Poseidon's Fury, from its incredibly mysterious facade, to the first two foreboding rooms, to its impressive water vortex, and the final ridiculous battle, have all come together into one of the strangest experiences ever produced for a theme park. I understand why it's time to close, but it will certainly be missed by those interested in themed experiences. Just outside of Poseidon's Fury is a shop, Treasures of Poseidon. While it's often overlooked and the merchandise itself is mostly clothing and jewelry, I do occasionally like to walk in there just for the theming alone. I enjoy the Atlantean aesthetic, filled with props that range from Greek-style helmets, to mysterious mythological statues, and aquatic fishing gear. I also do like how the figure of the merman version of Poseidon merges through the stonework, allowing you to see his backside fin in the rotunda once you step inside. I don't know why this one single detail fascinates me, but Islands of Adventure is full of them if you take the time to explore. Continuing further and out of the Lost City, the theming transitions to Sinbad's Bazaar, which contains a number of shops as well as quick service eateries such as Fire Eater's Grill and Delicious Kebabs. If you notice, the architecture is a mix of both the medieval Middle East, with the occasional structure derived from more ancient civilizations like the Sumerians or Assyrians. One of the shops is also focused on European knights, working to show influence from Merlinwood. I believe I also spot a few elements that might be inspired by ancient Greece, tying what should be a drastically different thematic area in with the Lost City pretty seamlessly. For example, the face on the Mystic Fountain feels like something that would fit on the rockwork of Mythos, and the fountain itself has been a fun character since the opening of the park joking with and teasing guests as it squirts them with jets of water if it manages to lure them close enough. While often bypassed today, I remember how popular the Mystic Fountain used to be, especially when it sat in front of the main pathway of the now-closed Sinbad Stunt Show. You're still able to wander around this area a bit and see its impressive facade, but the former show used to be the thematic anchor for this portion of the Lost Continent. Titled The Eighth Voyage of Sinbad, I do recall that it was initially a pretty popular stunt show, but going back and watching through it again, it's just... absolutely terrible. As the show begins, a loud explosion startles the crowd, and an unseen narrator demands silence. The narrator sets the scene, describing that this is the cave of the evil sorceress Miseria, and that her most prized possession is a magical ruby, known as the Sultan's Heart. 
Whoever possesses the ruby will be granted immense magical power. The show starts out with Sinbad's sidekick running out into the scene, struggling to fight off some sort of monster in what is intended to be a comedic sequence. The name of this particular character is unfortunately Kebab, and as he fights, Sinbad swings down to join him in the scene. The next three minutes consist of the characters meandering around the cave looking at treasure, performing the occasional stunt, and making the absolute worst and outdated pop culture references. There's a few clever things here and there, but this portion of the show is generally uninteresting. Eventually, Sinbad and Kebab discover Omora, a princess who has been kidnapped by Miseria. After another two minutes of meandering around with more bad puns, unfunny gags, and annoying pop culture references, Sinbad decides to go for the ruby. This portion of the show is somewhat interesting as he climbs the cave wall, activating a few stage triggers to make it seem as if part of the cave is collapsing in a way that reminds me of the traps in the Indiana Jones stunt spectacular. As Sinbad grabs the ruby, a pyro effect creates the illusion that it disappears along with Amora, as maniacal laughter fills the stadium. The evil sorceress Miseria appears, and it becomes quite apparent that through her transatlantic accent, overuse of the word fools, and general costume design with a magical staff that holds the ruby that resembles Maleficent from Sleeping Beauty, that this character is essentially actually just Maleficent. To be fair, I do like how her magic staff does have a pyro effect that works in conjunction with the stage triggers. The next 10 minutes of the show are just more of the same minor stunts, as the main characters take turns fighting with Miseria's various supernatural goons. During all of this, the dialogue is permeated with slightly sexist humor, more bad pop culture references, and dialogue right out of a bad 1999 romantic comedy. During this time, Miseria will occasionally appear and do something mildly interesting, but otherwise, it's just a lot of the same boring nonsense. Finally, at the conclusion, Sinbad manages to steal the staff from Miseria, aiming it towards her as a stunt performer is ignited and runs around on fire, signaling her demise as she falls into the pool below. I remember the show fondly because of the cool set and decent use of pyrotechnics in the early aughts, but coming back to the show now, I completely understand why it was unpopular and closed in 2018. It was incredibly dated, and while an interesting way to pad out your day when Islands of Adventure was a relatively new park, I can see how it quickly became an expensive waste to operate when it was drawing so few crowds. A lot of the humor which came from 90s action movies and comedies aged extremely poorly and propped up the runtime of what was otherwise just a very average stunt show. I thought I missed The Eighth Voyage of Sinbad, but in retrospect, it's just tedious and unpleasant to watch. It played well with the culture of the crowds in its first 10 years, and I do enjoy that the show had an interesting original theme and set, but it ultimately ended up outstaying its welcome in a way that the Poseidon's Fury finale did not. When moving through the rest of Sinbad's Bazaar, you would go through a small section with a few more shops, and a quick service location known as the Frozen Desert, an obvious play on dessert. This section no longer exists today, and is currently the transition area where the Hogsmeade station for the Hogwarts Express resides. However, Sinbad's Bazaar would then transition to the final area of the Lost Continent, known as Merlinwood, based on the legends of King Arthur, but more broadly incorporating elements of European fantasy. For hosting two attractions, both of which were roller coasters, Merlinwood managed to actually be quite small in comparison to the rest of the Lost Continent. It contained a few shops, food stands, and a restaurant known as the Enchanted Oak Tavern, which was completely rethemed into the Three Broomsticks as part of Hogsmeade. This particular restaurant was notable for its facade of an overgrown tree, sporting a mysterious face, and while I only vaguely remember eating in there, I do recall liking its atmosphere. The first attraction I want to mention is the Flying Unicorn, a small family coaster that didn't open with the park, but was added a year later in 2000. It attempted to fix the complaint that the park had very little for small children to do, and was themed to a mechanical unicorn vehicle constructed by a wizard, 
using a unicorn horn he had found in the woods to allow the contraption to fly. Oddly enough, when the Wizarding World took over and the coaster was rethemed to Flight of the Hippogriff, the idea of using magic to make the cars fly was reused. However, the anchor attraction of both Merlin Wood and the Lost Continent overall was easily Dueling Dragons. Extremely unique for its time, Dueling Dragons consisted of two inverted B&M coasters that dueled in a completely new way. Up until that point, most dueling coasters were typically wooden and would essentially race each other side by side with mirrored layouts. What makes Dueling Dragons different isn't just that it was an inverted steel coaster, but rather that each side had a unique layout and elements that resulted in incredible near misses with the other train. The entrance to the attraction was flanked by these iconic statues, with the blue ice dragon being named Blizzrock and the red fire dragon named Pyrock. As you enter the queue, you move through Merlin's woods and into this incredible facade of a ruined castle. On entering the first few switchbacks, you would pass through a projected pre-show that would tell the legendary tale of the battle between the dragons and the king. The story, told through what is made to look like stained glass windows, relates how the castle was assaulted by the dragons looking for the king's riches. In desperation, after the king's army was defeated, he sought out Merlin to help him win against the dragons, but Merlin was too old to be of any help. The lands and people were turned to ash as the dragons prevailed, and Merlin remained in the castle to discourage brave warriors from attempting to challenge them. Moving further into the queue, riders would witness Merlin's open spellbook, and as they proceed further, they would encounter the victims of Pyrock. The walls were lined with the armor of fallen knights burned by Pyrock's breath, with each set of armor possessing an inscribed poem that describes how their knights perished. Moving further, the next hallway reveals the victims of Blizzrock, frozen and hanging from the rafters above. Finally, riders enter the longest portion of the queue, which is the extent of catacombs, containing the skeletons of those unfortunate enough to find themselves targets of the dragon's wrath. At the end of the catacombs, the queue will split, asking riders to choose thy fate as they pick between fire or ice. Once seated on the train, computers weighed them and adjusted the lift tail speed accordingly, always allowing for the trains to engage in the perfect duel. After splitting at the top, both trains begin to go through each of their respective layouts and duel in three places. First, Blizzrock runs through a zero-g roll, as Pyrox sails up above. Next, the trains meet as they fly upwards through vertical loops, leaving no more than 18 inches between the feet of the riders on the trains. Finally, both trains will pass each other as they move through corkscrews. I won't discuss the rest of the layout of these coasters, but each was certainly unique and worth riding, as different from one another. The three dueling moments were not only incredible to watch from the outside, but felt very intense when you were on the ride yourself. The near misses with the other train with the whippiness of the elements made you feel like you were twisting in the air and fighting the other dragon. It was an incredible experience that unfortunately did not last very long. When the Wizarding World took over Merlin Wood, Dueling Dragons was rethemed to Dragon Challenge, putting riders into the role of challenging dragons in the Triwizard Tournament from Harry Potter and the Goblet of Fire. While much of the queue structure stayed the same, all of the incredible and atmospheric theming was torn out in favor of something much more underwhelming. The dragon tracks were rethemed to reflect different dragon species within the book, with Pyrock becoming the Chinese Fireball and Blizzrock becoming the Hungarian Horntail. However, while the queue was a significantly disappointing downgrade, what really broke interest in the attraction was the removing of the dueling. It was documented that in 2011, two separate incidents with loose articles resulted in injuries to riders, and as a precaution, Universal stopped the trains from dueling, as well as added metal detectors which would become standard for all large coasters at Universal Orlando since. Having ridden Dragon Challenge without the dueling aspect, I can say that the experience was greatly diminished. While each track had a decent layout, the lack of interaction with the other train resulted in the attraction experience going from incredible to just… kind of okay. When you have a great inverted coaster with Montu at Busch Gardens Tampa not too far away, the non-dueling Dragon Challenge felt extremely underwhelming in comparison. As the Wizarding World continued to exist with its incredible theming and excellent dark ride with Harry Potter and the Forbidden Journey, 
Dragon Challenge began to look like an outdated relic of the Lost Continent that was out of place, with its layouts becoming less and less appealing as the years passed by. The ride would close in September of 2017. It was replaced with Hagrid's Magical Creatures Motorbike Adventure in June of 2019. While I miss Dueling Dragons, I am of the opinion that if you replace a great and beloved ride, you really need to make sure that its successor is just as good or better. Hagrid's may not be nearly as intense, but it's still an incredible experience and is more than a worthy replacement. Dueling Dragons left a strong impression on many people, and as a consequence, the small area of Merlinwood felt like it had a much larger presence than just the tiny space it inhabited. The Wizarding World was the beginning of the long extended end of the Lost Continent when it rethemed and extended Merlinwood into Hogsmeade. I remember going to Islands of Adventure when the Wizarding World was new, being incredibly impressed with the theming and Forbidden Journey. However, the Lost Continent just did not feel the same without Merlinwood and Dueling Dragons, and the attraction itself had already ceased dueling when I wrote it as Dragon Challenge. While I like Poseidon's Fury, and I still think it's a strong attraction, if you don't mind the camp, it's just not strong enough in conjunction with Sinbad to pop up the remainder of the land. When Lost Continent lost Merlinwood, it failed to feel relevant to the park anymore, existing as a placeholder for something that would come later down the line. Yet, the Lost Continent has continued to exist as an empty shell of itself over the last 13 years, made worse with the understandable closing of Sinbad, and now Poseidon's Fury. The attraction did close in 2020 as a cost-saving measure as the park saw lower attendance. However, after two years of being closed, Poseidon's Fury reopened in March of 2022, newly repainted and refurbished. That's part of why its sudden closure is so unexpected, but I have to speculate that the building is probably experiencing too many expensive maintenance problems to justify remaining open with so little interest from park crowds. When I went through recently to experience the attraction one last time, I noticed that the cube was leaking water profusely, leaving pretty significant puddles all along the floor, which I suspect may be part of much more expensive problems. That's why I'm also inclined to think that whatever will eventually come to replace Lost Continent will come many years down the line, because I don't think that anyone suspected that Poseidon's Fury would close so suddenly. In my opinion, it's likely that the Lost Continent will continue to exist as an empty shell of its former glory for many years to come until it is eventually replaced with something more exciting. Now of course, if you reside in the theme park community, I'm sure that you've heard that the prevailing rumor is that the land was eventually planned to be replaced with The Legend of Zelda. I recently just visited Super Nintendo World in Hollywood, and even as a smaller and budget cut version of the full land that would be coming to Epic Universe, it was still incredibly impressive and popular. Universal has continued to build hit after hits over the past four years, and if the rumor for The Legend of Zelda is true, I'm excited to see The Lost Continent finally put to rest, even if I do miss its former excellence. The land itself was an incredible and impressive staple of the early years of Islands of Adventure, and it will be missed, but as it has continued to lose itself piece by piece, it just simply became irrelevant. It first lost its charming Merlinwood section and its anchor attraction of Dueling Dragons, leaving the rest feeling thematically incomplete. With the closing of Sinbad, even though it was a bad show, Sinbad's Bazaar lost any reason to really exist. Finally, with the closing of Poseidon's Fury, I suspect that the land will sit vacant for many years to come, reminding us of its former past as we witness the crumbled ruins of Poseidon's Temple truly abandoned. If you enjoyed this video and if you haven't already done so, I would again ask you to leave a like. As always, if you enjoy video essays like these but have not yet hit the subscribe button with bell notification, you can do so to be alerted to new videos as they release.